to audit the Building and Ground Subcommittee. Roll call, please. Member Gately? Present. Member Castellanos? Present. Member Reed? Present. Okay, today um, we're, we're looking to vote on a wash and pack shade structure, um, a proposal, and also a compost and wood chip yard. It's, yep. And um, is so here I would speak? like, so I want to invite up Hazel Kiefer and Osher Lyon up to the table to have a conversation with the Buildings and Ground Subcommittee. I also want the Buildings and Ground Subcommittee to know that um, they have the blessings of, of uh, Principal Cruz and also the, the community. Good evening, everyone. Hi. Nice to see you all. I'm Hazel Kiefer, Associate Director of Farms and Food for the Food Project. Hey, good evening. My name is Osher Lyon, and I'm the farm manager at the Angles Farm School. Um, so we're here to present a couple of proposals that you have in front of you. Um, we are a small farm, but we grow a ton of food and um, distribute that food through farmers markets and mobile markets in the city. We are currently looking at ways to systematize and make some of the farm operations more efficient and we think that these proposals will help us do that. We grow up to 20,000 pounds of fresh vegetables on under an acre of land there at the Ingalls School um, every summer. So Asher can take you through the specifics. Yeah, so the first proposal is for the wash and pack structure and it's gonna be um, a simple 10 foot by 20 foot um, small wooden pavilion that we're going to construct um, with some youth in Lynn and this structure is really going to help our youth employees um, get out of the sun and be able to wash our produce so we can take it to the Lynn farmers market etc um, we had a, a pop-up tent which unfortunately got wrecked in a, a windstorm so um, having this wooden structure there um, would really bring um, a, a really nice um, presence um, of, um, of, a, of a shade structure to the farm and help everyone wash in, in shade. Yeah. Um, should we talk about the second one too? Yeah. So um, our second proposal is we are looking to expand the farm just a little bit to create a mulch and compost area. So currently our footprint isn't large enough to hold um, our finished compost and our wood chips that we bring onto the farm. And so um, we're unable to operate um, in an efficient way because our compost piles are overflowing into our roads. So um, there's a small strip just outside the fence. Um, I think it's like a 30 by 70 foot long um, yard. And we're looking to um, expand and, and have our wood chips um, over there. And that's so that our youth, we employ about 40 youth um, across the city um, and from other suburbs in the summer. And a lot of these youth, when we employ them, they bring wood chips in and out of the farm so that we can keep the weeds down. Um, and we've spoken to neighbors in the area and they're all okay with it. We've spoken to the principal as well. Um, so yeah. Just to be clear, when we're talking about compost, we're talking about finished piles of compost that we bring in to the farm. Um, this is a long-standing practice and it's a way of remediating urban soil. So we're always um, adding compost onto the beds, building the soil up because we are an urban farm. That's standard practice. We're not talking about um, anything smelly. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Um, Member Castellanos. Thank you so much for your presentation and the work being done. Um, very creative way to, to, to utilize that space. Um, I grew up around that area. It's, uh, it's amazing. I drive by that area a lot too as well and could imagine um, how our students' um, experience would be um, enhanced with having this on the premises. How would we, how are we utilizing that experience. I know we had the salad bowl program. Um, we had uh, many initiatives around um, mm -hmm. farmer growth, food project. You guys have always been our partner here, and we appreciate you. But what would um, 
what capacity do you see this project? Um, is it going to increase capacity with our students being able to kind of see what that <laughs> process looks like? Like, how does that look like? What's the season too? I want to know, like, when they do when this is being harvested. I'm trying to like imagine because in the winter time, um, it's a little bit slower. But once it starts getting to the spring, it must be really fun for our students to kind of see them plant the seed and kind of go through that whole process. <laughs> Yeah, so I can speak to that. Um, so yeah, we do run uh, what we call salad days um, at 13 schools right now um, in the city. Um, and we certainly do that at Ingalls School as well. Um, we So that's young children, third graders coming out, planting seeds, and then harvesting salad and having a salad taste day. Um, it's very exciting it's very noisy and fun um and we are also we have a school ingles school garden um on site that's part of the farm that we're revamping this year osher's done a ton of work on that since he came on um and we so part of the issue right now that we're having with the um all of the piles of mater raw materials that we're bringing into the farm are being dumped on what we call the farm road but it's it's in the footprint of the Ingalls School Farm. Um, we would like for those piles to move to at the outer edge so that it's more accessible. Right now that road is really, it's uneven, it's really hard to walk on, and sometimes it's completely blocked by piles of compost, which is not an inviting atmosphere. Um, we also are doing and did last fall um, pop-up markets for the families, which are super popular. Um, we brought, I think like 500 pounds of cabbage over um, this past fall and it all disappeared in you know 15 minutes so um, we're definitely looking at ways that the farm can be more accessible um, and that people can be reaping the harvest if you will um, more easily and connecting that with a little more ease um, to the school um, but to answer your question about timing salad days happens in the spring so it's planted um, usually starting in April harvesting um, right before the end of the school semester and then harvesting in a big way and f and pop-up markets and giving away food is more August September so early early school year and Hazel if you can also speak I, I think that one of the most exciting things that I experienced when I was principal of Ingalls is the youth program that they run on site at Ingalls. If you can just speak to sure. that program and the youth that you hire, and it's bigger than them just working on the land and, and the relationships they develop and the leadership skills you build. Absolutely. So um, as Asher mentioned, um, every summer we hire 40 to 50 new um, young people from Lynn schools and um, surrounding on the North Shore so from here to Gloucester. Um, these young people come together across difference to learn about agriculture. They do a lot of the actual work of running our farms. Um, and they also do leadership development, job training. For many of them, it's their first job. They do get paid to work with us. Um, and they are running our farmers markets. They are planning community events um, and really learning how to make change in their communities and how to um, use their voices. And by that, I mean um, everything from public speaking to problematizing and um, learning about food systems, um, the social landscape that we live in. Um, so that is a huge central part of what we do and how we are growing food with young people. Thank you. That kind of asked my, my question too. My second part was the the cost, the maintenance, the the building process, and I saw that North uh, we're utilizing. I think Youth Build would be part of the yeah. development of this project, which is awesome. Yeah. Very familiar. I'm actually on the North Shore CDC board, awesome. and uh, we we work with Youth Build a lot. I love that program. So we're looking to. So what would be the cost, the maintenance of this? So Tough. we are going to source the materials. Um, we've budgeted $3,000 for that, and that's from our own operating budget for this year. Um, yeah. Is that usually the price? Like, what, How much does something like this cost? Yeah, I actually did something really similar, slightly smaller, at another farm uh, three years ago with Doug Bilton from Youth Build. They built it for us um, at Newhall Fields Community Farm. Um, and it's a very similar structure. It's really simple and open. It's really just um, framing with a roof um, for shade. Yeah. Oh. 
Member Gailey. Well, I did my research and I, I looked into the um, shed and um, you got the seal of approval from the ISD department and that's really important to me because they would know. Um, and B, you answered my second question was what kind of compost heap, anaerobic, aerobic? I don't know. Like usually they break down with the anaerobic and then you, but you're saying they already broke down all the material and they're bringing it. So that's pretty darn good. Um, as Deputy Powers said, that it's thrilling for our children to get this experience, seeing where I grew up in Lynn, Massachusetts, my whole life, and I had to go to college to learn about bioagriculture, and then I had to go to another school for a non-resident term out there in New, uh, University of California, Santa Cruz, and learn how to do 18-foot organic beds. So this is a wonderful skill. I'm happy to see it, and I like, I, I really am <laughs> very much for this, if my committee can understand my pushing them <laughs> to make sure this goes through. But that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Is there a motion? I make a motion to move forward. Second. Roll call, please. And bring it to the full committee. And bring it to the full bring committee. It to the full Thank com you. Member Gately? Yes. Member Castellanos? Yes. Member Reed? Yes. Um, motion to adjourn? Second. Member Gately? Yes. Member Castellanos? Yes. Member Reed? Yes. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. For Thank you. <coughs> Great work. Thank you. All right, so that brings us into the open mic session. The open mic session is designed to provide an opportunity for citizens to express their views on a matter of concern to the school committee. The sessions are not designed to encourage debate or lengthy exchange of views, but are to have the committee understand numerous points of view. The committee would appreciate speakers keeping their presentation to three minutes in order to accommodate as many people as time permits. The chair reserves the right to limit the number of speakers on the same topic to three. All speakers must be at least 18 years of age or enrolled in high school and public schools district and having discussed their views with a student government representative. The chair reserves the right to rule the speaker out of order if they feel that the speaker's comments are personal in nature. If a speaker's comments are directed at a school committee member or a member of school administration in attendance, that member, through the chair, may address the individual. The sessions will promptly commence 15 minutes prior to the start of the regular school committee meeting. Is there anyone wishing to speak at open mic? Anyone for open mic? Last call for open mic. We will close open mic and move into the second regular meeting of the school committee. Roll call, please. Member Castellanos? Present. Member Dugan? Present. Member Gately? Present. Member Pena? Present. Member Reed? Present. Member Satterwhite? Present. Mayor Nicholson? <clears throat> Present. All please rise for a salute to the flag and remain standing for a moment of silence. So please remain standing and join us in a moment of silence in recognition of William Fields, former teacher, passed away December 15, 2023. John Pento, retired teacher, January 6, 2024. William Frost, retired deputy superintendent, January 16, 2024. And Kevin Ramos Mejia, LBTI student, January 23, 2024. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, next item is the minutes. Um, make a motion to um, accept the minutes from the first regular meeting on January 11, 2024. Is there a second? Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Next is presentations. So first this evening we have the uh, program of studies and our interim executive director of curriculum instruction, Molly Cohen, will be doing the presentation. Good evening. Good evening. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Welcome to the new members. Mrs. Adams. 
Letter White, Mr. Reed. Here we go. So I'm Molly Cohen. I'm the Interim Executive Director of Curriculum and Instruction. And I'm excited to be here tonight to share the hard work of many folks. This presentation I'm sharing tonight is the actual presentation that we use to guide our work. So this is what the members of our team saw. And then some of the slides are obviously modified for you. Um, let's get started. So the objectives for this evening for school committee is to describe the program of studies and the process of revision to explain the need to develop one comprehensive document to celebrate the creativity of our many stakeholders and contributors, teachers, students, guidance counselors, department heads, everybody in the uh, district office supported us in this endeavor, which I'll explain, and to highlight some course recommendations that indicate the expansion of advanced and additional content courses. Okay? All right. Okay, so when we begin our work together, First, this was with the um, assistant directors of all the content and the department heads. Those are really like our experts in the, in the field of, of curriculum and instruction. We grounded our project in some common knowledge and uniform vocabulary with a clear vision forward. So we start with the definition, and then we talked about the work we were about to do. Like, how are we re-envisioning the clear progression of the grade 9 through 12 courses, how are we ensuring that there's access to div diverse courses for diverse stu students and ensuring that we have accurate descriptions so that our students and families can make informed decisions? I've talked about this before, but all of our meetings, when we come together, we ground them in some norms. Um, and so these norms just ensure that our work is collaborative and that the work that we do is rooted in the core values from our strategic district plan, which is inclusiveness, professional responsibilities, uh, shared collaboration, lifelong learning, high expectations. So that's the work that we do. We always ground them in norms. Okay, so the NIAS standards are the standards that inspire us to focus on the student experience and perspective. So our entire collective work, uh, pre-K through even like grade 13, when we think of our program at Salem State, is to inform, educate, and guide our Lynn students into their future career pathways. We must prepare them for their dynamic and competitive workforce that they'll be entering. So how do you begin this work? First, you have to start from where you are. So the very first thing we did was we self-assessed what we had in place, and then we identified the key aspects that we wanted to change or transform. So for example, historically, the program of studies lived and was maintained by uh, the, um, uh, the secretary in the deputy superintendent's office. So that was more like a code I mean, excuse me, a log of the codes and the course descriptions. So it wasn't a living document that people were interacting with. It was more like a document that was kept for the record of what we had and what we offered. Last spring, we took out, we took the program of studies out from that office and brought it into the curriculum office where it really should live. So when we came together, we had to set our objectives for the work ahead. So now I'm talking about the teams, all of the teams that came together to work on revamping the program of studies. We, these were our objectives during the project. So to create accurate course descriptions, to create a progression to demonstrate a sequence of rigor, to create a list of potential future courses to meet more diverse needs as you know the world is transforming, to create a proposal for a process for adding courses to the program of studies, including like innovative courses. So we want to make sure that we're getting as many voices and stakeholders in the build out because this should be expansive and a living document. Um, and to create a communication plan to share with um, our families and students how they can have more ownership in the course scheduling of our students, which I'll explain a little bit later. 
So this is how we navigated the plan. You know, we broke it down into phases, and then we broke that into manageable chunks, so everybody had a different role. Um, and then we collaborated with different people on an iterative cycle of like building something, getting feedback on it, rebuilding it, and then revising it several times. I do want to mention that our next step is really to build out progressive class or progression of classes in middle school and high school. So it's easiest to explain how we already are connected middle school to high school when we talk about math. So for example, when you're thinking about that you know building competitive students for math particularly you need them to start in 6th grade they you want that to build that out in 6th grade so that they're taking for example uh, pre algebra in 7th algebra in 8th so then they go into honors geometry in 9th that makes them a far more competitive student than this misnomer that your high school career starts in ninth grade because it doesn't it starts earlier Okay, so then in phase one, we looked at some exemplars from other programs of studies, right? Like we looked at really competitive schools. What do they have? Are we missing anything? Where's their perspective? So um, competitive districts as well. What, is there anything that we're missing in terms of the education that we offer our students? Then we brought together, we, this is where we got into the weeds. So we had to like look at course codes, uh, the different, making sure they match, making sure there's not duplication, um, and then sort of like cleaning it up as well. Okay, so then another needs assessment. So after we created the draft version of the course descriptions, progressions, and pathways, we had to self-assess again to ensure that we didn't have any equity gaps or missed opportunities for updated coursework. Here is where we presented to Dr. Alvarez to include her insight and vision for innovative and competitive programming. And as you know, Dr. Alvarez is very competitive, so we had to ensure that we had a robust program. Um, we're still in the drafting phase. This part I'm excited about, we haven't started this work, but this is the real connection with students and families, and this is like a cultural shift that I'm really looking forward to. So what we're talking about here is where like technical leadership, building out a program of study seems very technical, and adaptive leadership, which is like a whole culture shift, is coming together. And so we have the program of study, well, we're revising the program of studies. But ultimately, what we want to do, that whole idea of it being interactive in a living document, is to engage students and families in how to intentionally and thoughtfully work together to plan out a progression of studies. And so this is technical work. So you know there will have to be some um, training. There will have to be some incorporation of some skill set. Like, for example, we have a student portal for scheduling, but we have to really encourage and teach the students how to use it. They can actually program their own. They can put in their own um, course requests. They can see their transcript. They can track their own GPA in there. So we want to get them really involved in the, their ownership of building out their own competitive profile. So for our future work, this is where we are in terms of growing and expanding. We want to make sure that we're being as competitive as we can, as cutting edge as we can. I mean, the heart, I think what's most challenging and exciting about working in education is that we're preparing students for jobs that haven't been created yet, right? We're, pre we're preparing students for having like the critical thinking skills to be able to shift qu quickly when like a computer language or computer programming is obsolete and they have to learn a brand new one on the job on the fly. So um, we want to constantly be updating this. Therefore, we will be continually planning out more courses, maybe revisiting old courses that no longer are relevant, um, and constantly having the conversation with, stat with principals around what is the staffing, what is the funding, what is really feasible, what do our teachers have the capacity to teach at this time. All of that is involved. Um, in when you're building out a program of studies.
So then I just left a few um, exciting examples. One of our five goals for the district this year is um, increasing enrollment in advanced coursework. And so the probability and statistics, it, I put revival because we had that program a few years ago and then we weren't enrolling students in it, but that is a key course colleges and the business world are, are looking for con considering all of the quantitative data that they have to analyze. Um, another exciting course is the personal finance course, which um, we're waiting to hear on a grant for that. Um, and that's like a very hot topic right now in terms of, um, you know, whether or not it will be required down the line in all, you know, nine to 12 schools. Um, and then something like Modern Band is an exciting course because it broadens the, um, the profile of students who engage in band. Modern Band is more around like a cult, like and um, including more cultural pieces of music and um, different instruments as well. That's all I got. That's it? <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Molly. Sure. I, I just want to add that this, um, you know, just thanking all of the educators, students, and um, parents that have been contributing right to the feedback that we need to just do some of this this was some of the foundational work um, program of studies really lived at each of the high schools mm -hmm. uh, and wasn't a district comprehensive document and so when Molly started the presentation she pointed out right that there was a need to have one comprehensive document because what we're looking at is the student experience so what a student is able to take at one high school they should be able to take at another high school um, and then as we uh, create pathways where there are different program studies there still needs to be a very clear understanding for students and parents to be able to make the choice like do I want to be a STEM student or do I want to be a you know student that is more involved in languages or you know humanities or do I want to do performing arts um, as a focus so as we go through these changes right this will continue to be a resource um, for all of us to make sure that students are able to make the, the choices that they, they want to make um, and what exciting courses await, right? It's exciting to see your path between six through 12. Like what, what, what could I possibly take? Um, what is engaging? What are the things that interest me? What do I want to explore? Um, this doesn't exclude obviously electives that each of the content areas will still continue to offer, but it does offer a more focused um, way of looking at how we look at each content area. So I just wanted to add that to, so that we have a clear understanding on how we're using this document. Um, it's been a tremendous amount of work. It's been in the works for seven months, at least, at least, at least seven months. Um, and it will continue to be worked on. And once we are closer to a draft, I would say uh, in the month of March, mm -hmm. maybe or late February, early March, we'll, we'll look at bringing the whole thing uh, back to the committee for uh, review. So. Awesome. Mayor Pena, Mayor Reed, Mayor Gailey. Thank you, Molly. Thank you for the presentation. I appreciate all the hard work and all the stakeholders, everyone involved. One of the questions I had, are you meeting with the DEI team, Bobby Bishop, uh, to when you're- Yep, and the data, out? yeah, I skipped through my notes, but I thank you for asking that. Yes, I want to just publicly thank everyone because to Dr. Alvarez's point, um, this was a lot of hours, a lot of different workshops. We had um, the MLE office, the SPED office, innovation office, principals, guidance counselors, department heads, um, assistant directors, teachers are involved. We're trying to get some feedback from some students as well. So that is the point to, to ensure that there's equity. And, what, and so one of the conversations really is like, what are the barriers 
to different students being able to access advanced coursework. And so we had a robust conversation around what are the prerequisites that we're, we're requiring. And at one time it was a grade, just a grade. But as you know, grades are very subjective and without a uniform grading policy, yeah. you know, you can lead to just some implicit bias there. So we're looking at a different array of courses for entry. Mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of almost answers some of my qu the next question. But um, how are you? What are, what methods are you using to have more parent engagement? What ideas have you been? Oh yeah, thank you. Parent engagement, Very excited student for that. voices. Yes. So um, we have a few. So one thing is what we'd like to do is create a video around how to access the portal. Um, and then we already have a captive audience because our guidance counselors go, or the high school guidance counselors go down to um, schedule the middle school students um, every spring. So they have the, enti the entire eighth grade, they go through the entire eighth grade. So we're going to take that opportunity to workshop those students on getting into the portal early um, and then we're also, the guidance counselors will start to work with their others, the upper level students who, many of them do use the portal, but we wanna get in the transcript, the unofficial transcript, so they can be tracking their own progress as well. Thank yep. you, thank you. Yep. And last, are we working on getting grants especially for the innovative classrooms and, and studies and works that we want to bring up. Are yep, and this? so with the programming here, so you saw the um, biotechnology, mm -hmm. the personal finance um, is a grant as well. So there are grants connected specifically to coursework and course development. There's a lot mm -hmm. of federal and state grants yep. that we need to work Yeah, absolutely, on. yeah, especially with CTI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, that's all. Sure. Appreciate it. I'm Marie. Yep. Thank you, Molly. I was I was very excited when I saw the agenda because uh, last year when I was looking through this, I, I honestly thought there was a lot of uh, counterintuitiveness when it came to some of the uh, pro programs of study. So very excited about that. Uh, my first question is: So does this require like is are the courses changing in themselves? Does this require new curriculums, uh, different educators, things like that? Is it more of a reorganization of the, the whole thing? Yeah, thank you. So it's a little bit of both. Um, some of the courses are being updated, right, and um, more modernized. And then some of the courses are going to be newly developed. However, all of the courses, even the newly developed courses, lie in the standards that already exist. Gotcha. So like genocide is a good example of a course that um, we're looking to develop right now that is that all of the materials in that sure. course align with the standards. Sure, so it's not mm -hmm. a big, yeah. Sure yeah. Not a uh, my other question was, I actually was talking with a couple of parents mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago, um, and they were talking about how they felt like their students weren't in the right program to study. Is there any work being done to ensure that uh, students are placed, whether it be level interest, because I think it's a combination of student interest, you know, uh, guidance intervention, and, uh, you know, parent uh, advice as well. Is there any work being done to ensure they're in the right uh, coursework? Yeah, so um, I'm not sure what those parents mean, so I, I would yeah. love to hear sure. more about that. Yeah. Um, but in terms of that's the idea of really engaging the parents and the students in the program of studies via the work it, with the guidance counselors, because you're right, there are recommendations to be made based on interest and skill level and aptitude. Um, but as well, you know, sometimes an interest in something that you may not, it may not appear that you have an aptitude for could be a bigger motivator factor, motivating factor. Um, and so those conversations generally happen in the guidance, in, you know, the world of guidance and the meetings that they have with families. Mm -hmm. But maybe if we're doing the on the road show, um, we can really get that feedback from families yeah. while we're presenting this new way of um, being involved. Thank you. Yeah. Remember Gailey. Good job. Thank you for the large print. <laughs> <laughs> one, I have like a few questions. Okay. But on phase one, mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with the acronym DAAT. Oh, that's the new um, data center. So it's not the data center, actually. It absorbed the data center. So it's um, the data accountability and assessment team. Mm -hmm. okay. That's under uh, Dr. Shorter. Sorry. No, it's okay. I just, I wasn't familiar, so I ask. Yep, sure. That's my job. Um, okay. This summer, mm -hmm. um, uh, a person, uh, a parent, wanted to know about 
What are we doing to replace studies? What are we doing to um, challenge his daughters or mm-hmm. his son? Mm-hmm. I won't say. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so this, I think, is going to bridge that gap, and I'm really happy to see that. And it's worth the seven months. Mm-hmm. I'm really happy because then it will be more challenging for everybody. This is great. Um, and the parents and student voices involvement is really, really good for me to hear because I hear otherwise so I'd rather have them be able to talk to you guys directly and let you know what their needs based are I'm excited about the new curriculums coming in I think that out of the box thinking and innovation is the way to go and our district is in for a treat it might be challenging because anything anything that is worth its while you have to work hard at you have to be challenged and having that will make you a better individual and make make you learn more, make you happier. Because if you find a career that you absolutely love, and you know this, Mm -hmm. if you find it, then it's not even like working. It's like, oh, they pay me to do this? And I used to say that, believe it or not, every day that I taught, except on certain days. (laughs) Um, The create (laughs) a communication plan to share ownership and youth with students, families, and teachers. How are you planning on doing that? Yep, so we already... Guidance? Yeah, we started to sketch that out with the team. So we have a monthly timeline for making that video that I talked about. That would be in different languages for so that we're ensuring that all of our families are able to access it and that video would kind of explain how families can engage with the program of studies um, both on the technical side and just on the like conceptual side and then having the guidance counselors and the um, family court the family and community coordinators supporting families around how to do some of this work so Mm -hmm. we'll find any gaps that we may have Yes, yes, yes. That's so important. Yeah. But I do have to shout out the school leadership because the, the it's really the school leadership that carries a lot of this work, and the principals have been um, hugely invested in this. So, you know, when it comes to families, when families need to reach out, they reach out to their principals and the school team. So they, we really um, are excited that they're, on, they're, they're very excited about this as well. So for people that may be out there in TV land mm-hmm. saying, yeah, sure, when is this going to happen? When can we plan on something like this going to happen, the spring? Like yep, February, year? March, right in, the, in that window between February and March, right? And as, and as soon as we're ready to roll with this, we'll have it up on the um, website. So we're building out a curriculum and instruction website right now, each of the assistant directors um, have built robust, like a robust platform with the standards, with links to it, um, and then this will be front and center. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and again, this is a very, ba- this is the very basic, right, and foundational work that we needed to do, and now we'll start layering in what are those innovative pathways that we um, are looking at with the school teams to continue to add to this. We have many tools and resources already. Um, that provide us with a lot of data and information about student aptitudes and strengths that um, we're looking for ways to use uh, in, a, in, a, in a more effective way, like Naviance, like when we look at um, AP potential from PSAT reports, right, and we have the discussion around what student aptitude is because when we take a a PSAT and even looking at the PSAT maybe even 8-9 right so when you're taking it in middle school you're already able to make informed decisions about I would be great at right the social sciences the language arts track the math and um, science track and so what are the things that I should be considering and looking at as that program of studies I guess you're not remember Saturday, right? Uh, thank you, Molly, for your presentation. Very robust, as always. Uh, my question is around uh, partnerships. When I think about program of studies, I think about, okay, how are, we, how are we evolving with the workforce, right? How are we adapting to industry? As you talked about, like, 10 years from now, the jobs, the skills that we're going to need to be successful might be different. What are we doing to ensure that we're um, aligning the right partnerships with our thoughts of how we phase this out Absolutely. how we phase yeah. it in, really? Sure, absolutely. So the um, innovation department, their team, 
was working with us in regards to the early college um, pathway. And then um, Dr. Alvarez just alluded to some other build out that we're looking at. So we're right now investigating IB programming, the International Baccalaureate programming and what that could look like. So as we envision the different pathways, then would come in the community partners. Mm -hmm. and, and as part of that, we're also looking at um, colleges and universities mm -hmm. to help us develop, right? What are the pathways? What are the program of studies? And then possibly like future curriculum for some of those. Um, Dr. Gardner has reached out to MIT um, for some of the STEM work that we're envisioning. Um, she's reaching out to them, uh, to the Sloan uh, School of Business as well to look at some of the um, development and financial technologies work that we want to do as well. And so as we work through right each of what is that progression of courses, um, we're really starting with academia and also then including and bringing in like who are those workforce development? Is it GE? Is it, you know, pharmaceuticals? Is it, um, and inviting them in to see who wants to partner with us um, to support our work. Uh, and I'd also just like to raise that when we talked about when we were receiving feedback, we got some feedback from um, Lynn Vocational Technical Institute because they they were saying in the first version of the draft that it was very college heavy in terms of how we had loaded the beginning entrance of the and when you enter the document we had like the different requirements for college and so we actually moved those into the appendix because as we know vocational studies are in incredibly lucrative um, and uh, really fast track into the workforce for people who really want to get into the job immediately um, as opposed to like four years of studies. So that also, that voice and that piece is involved here as well. And you you know there's so many workforce um, partnerships with Lintec uh, that will be represented in this document. That's my second question about TTE. Actually, yep. that's actually very. Um, it's very important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. That was my first place of employment in the Lynn <laughs> Public Schools. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. I commend you and all your work that you've been doing. Um, as a graduate of LVTI, I am super excited about, about this program of studies, to be honest. Um, just a question I'm, I was thinking of, is this also going to be implemented in, um, at Facto Larry? Yeah, so Facto follows the same coursework that we have as well, and then the, they also will be, their, their um, specialized programming will be involved, it will be part of this program as well. But when you talk about like college uh, preparation classes, they have the same. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And then just um, a comment um, from personal experience. So my daughter is currently experiencing an overpopulated, you know, um, school, but at a different level mm -hmm. because she's in lower class sizes because she's in honors. Mm -hmm. So I think that this is going to be great, uh, being able to create more courses um, with diverse needs and advanced courses will definitely positively impact our, our children. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I Thank you so much for the presentation and, and for you and everyone involved for the amazing work. It's very exciting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Great job, Molly. Hey, can I start over again? <laughs> Next item is community schools. There's a lot of us, so we're wondering if we could just stand and uh, teach your voices or pick up the microphone. Yeah, I think we need. can't pick up the microphone. Yeah, someone needs to. I think we need to speak into the microphone for the um, broadcast. So you should take a seat. You could take yeah, my you seat. Yeah, you got a seat. Is it gonna drive it all day? We'll we'll rotate. Yeah, we'll we'll rotate great. through the chairs. Exactly. Through the chairs. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it's a start. Click, click, click. 
This is like improv, right, <laughs> at its <laughs> best. <laughs> Amy, get over here. Kim is actually going to kick us off. You're good? Yes, She's I'm going to kick you off. Okay. <laughs> okay, I want to introduce our presenters this evening who will be updating you on the progress and the evolution of Ford and Washington in their journey to become community schools. We have with us this evening Principal Amy Nerrick from the Ford School, Principal Anthony Fry from the Washington School, and then we have our community directors, Amy Kruniak from the Ford School and Nina Hamza from the Washington School, and we have Sarah Link from the United Way. Before I move on, I wanted to send out a special thank you to Sarah, who has been an invaluable partner to Washington and Ford as well as the district. I wanted to thank her for her informed and thoughtful leadership in supporting the evolution of the community school model and framework within LPS. We thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I will open up the presentation. We want to go to the first slide. By grounding us in the primary objective for these schools in choosing this pathway, and it is student achievement. Our first slide highlights data from the Community School Project in New York City. This data brings to life the potential and the positive outcomes of the Community School strategy, including, but not limited to, higher attendance rates, lower chronic absenteeism, fewer discipline problems, improved academic performance, and a positive change in a student's trajectory to graduate. The benefits become even greater with time. Anthony and Amy will orient you to the community school strategy and framework and their alignment to LPS priorities. Washington and Ford community directors will highlight the partnerships and networks they are building that make their schools special and change the trajectory of their students. The directors will also discuss and inform for you early wins and emerging themes. Sarah will conclude and take us home and present the team's plans and actions moving forward. And I just want to acknowledge that this team is very grateful to the school committee for all your support. Yeah. I want to just in take a moment to introduce my colleague, Renee Omolade, who is also here with us tonight. She recently joined the United Way team as our senior director for community schools. Renee brings many years of work in Boston, most recently leading Boston's community school strategy. So we are thrilled to have her on the team and joining us and guiding us along the way as well. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. All right. Anthony, we're over to you. Um, is Amy going to read this? Is yeah, yeah, so Amy's going to read this, and then I'll get into the next one. Great. You want to read into the mic? Into the mic. Thank you. We just wanted to share a quote with you, um, and it states that the community school strategy, and we stress that it's a strategy, it's not a program, um, it transforms a school into a place where educators, local community members, families, and students work together to strengthen the conditions for student learning and healthy development. As partners, they organize in-school and out-of-school resources, supports, and opportunities so that the young people can thrive. So my piece of this is, um, first of all, well, thank you for having us here. This is amazing. Um, you know, it's always amazing to be able to present the stuff that means so much to us in the buildings. The work we do every day for kids and for our families, we don't often, you know, get to show that to everyone. So this is a, you know, it's a real privilege for us to be here. Um, we're going to start with the, the mission for LPS, the vision for LPS. Um, these are exactly what we are trying to do in community schools. I don't think they can align any better. When you look at committing to providing our students with safe, inclusive places to learn and be seen, that's what we do at a community school. That's what we strive for. Our vision on strengthening community, I mean, obviously, that's in the title of what we're doing. Um, working together so that students can thrive. Uh, the district goals of fostering you know, the multilingual learners and proficiency, building inclusive community, integrating mathematics and literacy skills. 
uh, this is what, you know, and Kim alluded to it in the beginning, achievement is the goal. Achievement is a goal, and building the community school is how we're going to get to that achievement. Because we're going to reduce, we're going to you know, take away the barriers, we're going to allow our families and our community to know that this is what is important to us. And we'll stand on it together, and that will allow us to, to go far. So um, it, the alignment with the district is, you know, it couldn't have been written any better. So we're very thankful for that uh, because it fits into exactly what we're trying to do at our buildings. All right. Musical chairs. So we're going to talk a little bit about the guiding framework that is supporting all of this work. Uh, this is a relatively new framework that was launched uh, last year in January, so those of you who were here in March saw this before. We're going to race through this so that you can really hear from the community school directors the great work that they've been, they've been doing. So this framework was really built from a number of national organizations who are really leading the community schools movement across the country. Uh, the Brookings Institute, the Coalition for Community Schools, the National Center for Community Schools, uh, and the Learning Policy Institute. So we take our guidance from them. And that what you'll really see here is an ecosystem that we are building. This is not a checklist of programs and a checklist of things that we're doing. This visual will really build out and represent the framework that's guiding the community schools work here in Lynn. Um, so at our center, this is our North Star, we are really focused on making sure that students thrive in flour flourish in thriving school communities. And then when we're thinking about who drives the work, it's important <coughs> for us to name <coughs> school-based folks, our community partners, our youth and families. And this is not a comprehensive um, representation of who drives the work, but we know that without these key players, community schools um, won't be successful. Our next gear in this wheel are really the ena enabling conditions. So without really deep trusting relationships and this shared vision that we are all building, both across the district and within the two buildings, um, having inclusive decision making and actionable data. We have so many pieces of data that we are looking at and so many different ways of looking at it, um, and that is really uh, our, our guiding um, conditions. And so the key practices of community schools are really, what are the six conditions that really should exist within a community school? And um, so there's four that have really been traditionally used. Um, our Department of Education uses it for a national um, federal community school grant really centered around these top four of integrated systems of support, powerful student and family engagement, collaborative leadership, and expanded learning opportunities. But in this new community schools forward, what's really important are these last two, which are the culture of belonging, safety, and care. And when we're talking about that, we're not actually talking about it only for our students, but for everyone who's in a school community, the educators, the staff, the teachers, the social worker. Um, having that culture within the school building is really critical to its success as well as um, the rigorous community connected classroom instruction, which was great to be a part of that previous conversation because um, we can see where that interconnectedness is throughout the, the work of the district. And finally, we've got the supportive infrastructure. So this work cannot exist in the district alone, in a building alone. This is really how are we working uh, to provide that supportive infrastructure across our ecosystem. So how are we really thinking about sustainable resources? Uh, how are we keeping all these partnerships live and active? What are our governance structures for engaging the community and parents in our decision making? And you can kind of go around the circle and really see how each of these uh, pieces of the infrastructure are so important in upholding uh, our vision and our values. So now we're going to turn it over to Amy and Nina to show you a little bit about what this looks like in each of their buildings. Do you want the animation right up? Oh, I don't know. Oh, all right, it's, here it is. <laughs> okay. So um, the previous image before, without the connections, is your traditional school. All schools have these networks with the exception of a community school director. What sets community schools apart 
is the mutually beneficial relationships within these networks to make each entity stronger. We'd like to give a few examples of our community school strategies and how we are working to strengthen these networks as it relates to Ford and Washington. <clears throat> as part of the assets and opportunity assessment, we have been meeting with families one-on-one -on -one to gather collective feedback and empower family voice and choice. We have also incorporated our staff and teachers into the AOA process to encompass educator perspective. I can speak personally to Ford and how excited our teachers are about new ways to accelerate student learning. <laughs> Additionally, our family liaison who is here tonight, Ms. Martinez, has been an integral part of introducing and adapting to the community school strategy. <coughs> Super, super. Hi. So um, I will echo everybody's thanks for having us here. We're very excited about this and the opportunity and the district as a, an integral member of this community school strategy has been really fabulous. We're so grateful to the support we've received from cent our central office colleagues and uh, folks throughout the district. Um, and the fact that you're taking you're investing energy in this strategy as a, a vehicle for um, improving the lives of our children and ensuring that they have the opportunity to uh, thrive academically, social, emotionally, all, all of that is fabulous. So we thank you for that. And our community partners are growing and growing and growing. When Amy and I started, there were a few um, in place already and those have expanded and they tell two people and they tell two people and they tell two people and so we're very grateful that the area churches have been very supportive, restaurants, supermarkets, stop and shop especially has been remarkably generous. Um, staff donate for things like our clothing and houseware giveaways and we're now, we now have partners with uh, local estate sale companies and Flannery Handyman. Um, they're donating things. So today we had an event at Washington and Amy had, you, is your event tomorrow? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, <laughs> where we're giving away all sorts of stuff, uh, which is just really fabulous because the need is so um, significant. We think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and making sure that folks have what they need. GE, the Y, um, Girls Inc., just there's a, a long, long list and we're very grateful and um, appreciative that it's growing. And when we think about partners also, it's not just that they're doing things for us, but that we are trying, um, we're finding ways to be supportive of them and um, so it's uh, mutually beneficial. I don't know if I know how to work this, but I'm, oh, oh there you go. All right, um, so a team-based based approach. Nina and I had the opportunity to attend the Community Schools Fundamental Conference in New York City back in October. Um, we actually had some team members also with us. Um, but perhaps the most impactful breakout session we experienced was a panel of superintendents and principals. Dr. Jocelyn Hively, superintendent in Bakersfield, California, stated, education is a team sport and kids must win. This quote serves as a reminder that students need to be at the center of education, which is the philosophy of the community school strategy and also the vision for Lynn Public Schools. Equally impactful was two months later when I was meeting with a parent from Ford. I, w I wish I had her presentation because it was 17 slides long and it blew my mind. Um, but she shared with me her dreams for her children's educational experience. The parallels between her vision and Dr. Hively's vision were clear. She stated, but working together with parents, staff, and our community, it can happen. Community school for me means everyone working together as a village. There is no I in team. Teamwork makes the dream work. How empowering is it for our students and families to feel that they are choice takers and decision makers? And our families share that. We say teamwork makes the dream work all the time. And this has provided an opportunity, this community school strategy has provided an opportunity for us to grow the capacity of parents in leadership roles. Um, Folks are stepping up to help with all manner of things and that makes them feel welcome in school. Their children see them at school and it's um, been very beneficial. Early wins. 
We'd like to highlight some of our early wins, which have included a noticeable increase in our family engagement. This is evidenced by turnout at our parent cafes, school-based events, and willingness of families to volunteer for these events. Through the community school approach, we are able to leverage parents as leaders. And while we recognize there is still a significant amount of work to be done, the basic needs of our families um, to be done to meet the basic needs of our families and students, we have begun coordinated efforts to address concerns regarding food insecurity and clothing needs. These efforts have taken the form of takeaway food bags, food pantries, and clothing drive events. And in our interviews and our interactions with, with families and staff, some, some needs have emerged. And attendance, you won't be surprised by. Um, Lynn and many communities across the country are dealing with chronic absenteeism, chronic tardyism. And so we're looking at ways to reward really good attendance and to incentivize attendance, a little bit of fun competition between grade levels and, and classes to, you know, let's, let's, let's get in here. We've got a lot of good stuff to do. Um, and we're also looking at things like possibly uh, providing some laundry um, laundry facilities for families so that if a kid doesn't have clean clothes they're not coming to school so we want to try to eliminate all those those barriers that are keeping them from school safety and space is another theme neither of us have uh, neither of our schools have parking lots and so the double parking with the hazards on as people are stopping in all sorts of crazy places to get kids in, in and out um, is challenging uh, we have at Washington there's lots of um, Deferred maintenance with water dripping in. We had to cancel a basketball game a few weeks ago because there was so much water on the gym floor. It was a slipping hazard for the children. So things like that, those kinds of uh, things are emerging as we're talking with families. We're also um, very interested in trying to provide some opportunities for before school and after school opportunities uh, for, for learning, arts, music, theater, uh, sports, things that will be more exciting than math or not that math isn't, I'm a, I love math, but not everybody loves math, right? So what's it gonna be that gets that kid to get to school that day? And it might be, I'll do math if I can play basketball, or I'll do that writing if I can be in the play, right? So those, those kinds of things. And language has come up as a really big interest, not just parents wanting to learn English, but the parents want their children to learn their home language, how to read and write in their home language. And our teachers want to learn the home languages. So Rosetta Stone comes to us is going to be so well received we're very excited about that and I've been teaching a bunch of people how to use Duolingo I've, I'm on day 320 and I can't believe how much I've learned in three to five minutes a day so I highly recommend it I stopped at Apple's did you <laughs> which is funny because I ended up with five boxes then, so oh bef before be before I get off the mic I want to um, pose a challenge how are you going to answer the question so what is this community school thing anyway so I suggest you come up with your elevator pitch. Mine is our community schools work to accelerate student learning by fostering partnerships with families and community members to create conditions where all kids are enabled to thrive. One sentence, but one long sentence, but what are you gonna say when they ask you? So if you need my help, give me a call. <laughs> All right, so just a, f a few things as we close out and uh, get ready for questions. Um, looking ahead, we uh, will do a deeper dive and really complete our asset and opportunity assessment, which is that deep data dive that Amy and Nina have been talking about. We're really looking at our broad network of community partners. Lynn is incredibly fortunate to have a wonderful uh, set of nonprofit partners who are really eager to join in this work and really be unified under this strategy so really thinking about what we're learning from that AOA process and bringing in the right community partners in each of the schools uh, and then to really hone in on what are our concrete goals that we are that we are looking toward and building our strategic plan to ensure that this is not just an initiative this is a long time strategy that we are all committed to uh, deploying our resources to uh, and then continued learning and professional development Renee talked about those six 
practices that really guide the community schools. We want to really look into those and make sure that we have um, all of the partners across the community and all of the faculty and families really versed in that language. We've got opportunities to attend in more national conferences to continue to learn um, from those around the country who are doing this work. Um, so lots of good stuff ahead. Did you have anything you yeah, wanted to close, close us out? out a little bit? Uh, sorry, just a minute. <laughs> so I just wanted to first, you know, officially thank everyone again. Um, uh, welcome to the new members of this committee. I haven't met all of you yet. Um, this is something that's very near and dear to the work that I've been doing in this city for 25 plus years. And when uh, Dr. Alvarez and Ms. Powers presented this as, you know, Washington would be a nice spot to try this work, what I thought of was out of the shadows into the sunlight. Um, this is a lot of work, and many of you sit here know that we were doing in the shadows. We're taking care of our families. We're helping our students. We're creating environments that are ripe for learning, but oftentimes was at the opposition of whatever the common narrative was. Now we're in a space where we can work together. Achievement is the goal of all of this. Mm -hmm. Achievement is what's going to set our kids, our schools, going to set them off for, you know, and what, and what achievement means to them. I'm not just saying, you know, you have to get A's and B's. We talked about that, right? It could be arts. It could be music. It could, you know, I'm just saying for them to be them, their best selves. So I just want this committee to know that this team is committed um, to the work we're doing. We will put our best foot forward every time we can. Children are at the center of the things we do, um, and nothing can really stop us. So I'm glad you're all on our team. You know, we appreciate you, we appreciate the support, and I really think it's gonna impact our families in a huge way. Here, so, here. thank you. Can I just thank you, add something to that? Um, yeah. You know, we meet monthly as a team, and we talk a lot about the fact that this is not random acts of programming. So we are not making any decisions about next steps unless it's coming from the families, right? And so our directors are spending so much time meeting with the families one-on-one -on -one, over Zoom, on the phone, um, to hear their feedback. And so that is what's driving everything we're doing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Member Dugan, Member Pena, Member Castellanos. Um, all right. Well, thank you for the presentation. I'm, I'm very excited for this, and I hope I'm speaking for the whole committee when I say, I, you know, I fully 100% support um, the strategy. Um, it, you know, just we talk a lot about making schools safe places for kids to learn, and, and kids can't learn without that safe place, and this is really putting it into action. So it's very exciting for me being an educator and then also being on this committee and being passionate about the students of Lynn, to hear your passion too, Principal Fry, uh, come out just now. So I, I do appreciate that. And, um, you know, uh, and, and I, again, I, I hope I'm speaking for the whole committee when I, when I say they do too. Um, I guess my, my questions are for Principal Fry and Eric. Um, what do you guys think the best, or the biggest strength is that's come out of this so far? I, I mean, right off the top, it's yeah. the, the voice of the families. Yeah. I, we had, I mean, after the second meeting, we invited people in, you know, and I've been at the school for a few years now, so I do know my families. I think they feel comfortable with me and coming in. We did an envisioning the future of, of, of Washington, and the families showed up and showed out. And we had interpreters in multiple languages, and by the time we were out, you know, people were hands up. You know, these are people who were sheepish and wouldn't even speak, and now they're saying, I'm you know, I'm proud of this and I want this for my, I want this for my, or I want this for our community. So I would just say, you know, it has blown me away that once you give them, right, we're just not rolling up the blinds. Right. Once you give them the keys to the door, you'd be surprised at what, you know, they feel ownership in it. And that's the biggest piece that has hit me so far is the level of commitment and the level of need and passion from our families. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I just again, I'm very excited to to hear what the future holds for this, and uh, you know, I think working together with our families is is critical to student success, as, as I think everybody in the room does. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, first of all, thank you, everyone. Thank you for, for the presentation. Thank you for all the hard work. Um, I met a young lady a couple years ago. I went to her office in Salem. She's at Salem State, Dr. Claire Crane. And uh, <laughs> she, uh, she had this model before and up in the Ford School, and it was, uh, I believe it was nationally recognized, and uh, we had the first lady come and visit Dr. Mm -hmm. Crane. And uh, I just sat there and, and, and listened. And uh, we're, after coming from COVID, you know, we're, we're, still, we're still trying to, like, get our feet back on the ground. And a lot of families are hurting. This is really, like, it, it's touching. It's personal, especially I, I – um, I'm involved, I volunteer, and I work at the YMCA, and I, I see a lot of the families, and, and, and not to get off topic, but just, you know, when you mentioned about building the culture is important there, like, I just, I really want to stand out, like, the work you've been doing, Mr. Fry, I, I've, I've seen, I talked to parents, and I really want to commend you on the work, and, 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 and like you said, and, and, and <laughs> like you said, this is something that's coming out the shadows into the light, and I know you've been working hard, both of you principals, I've been working hard engaging with families and I know about the pantry and this is like years ago I know about your pantry and, and, and you're you're touching many many lives and it's it's really important um, the fact too that when you you're interviewing families by family like that doesn't leave anyone out because every every student's important every parent's important everyone deserves a voice on the table and what you're doing is just so commendable. And, and, and after coming off COVID, like, it exposed so many inequities that's happening. And, and families are still struggling, you know. And, uh, I, and, and it's hard, you know. And, and this is, like, really taking the ball and, like, stop BS and meeting families where they're at. Because, you know, when, when, you're, when you're worried about housing securities, where you're going to live, I don't think education is the most important thing on the plate right there. Mm -hmm. No, but it is. Because it is a game changer. But when you're struggling... Edu I'm telling you, man, education is not important. Like, we're worrying about how we're going to eat, where we're going to live. Mm -hmm. You know, and people are hurting. And what you're doing is you're meeting families where they're at. You know, and, um, the, the, I could just think about all the things that could come out of this. Like, even with adult education, there's, mm -hmm. there's parents that want to learn. They want to shot. Give me a chance to learn a trade. Yep. You know, think about the partnerships that we could do. Work with GE and the, all the game changers, man. But just the fact that we have families engaging and all the community partners and the school district, we're supporting you, man. This is really, really touching. I know how I, I know the work you've been doing. I, I, I see it. I see the kids, and, and they all talk about. Even parents I talk to, they're like, "No, oh, I'm going to talk to you, <laughs> Mr. Fry. I got your back." <laughs> you know, and I know it's a, it's personal and dear to you. I know, the, I know the work you've been doing up there, up in the Highlands, and I, I really thank you from the bottom of my heart. Everyone involved, like, this is really, truly, like, meeting families where we're at, and we need it, you know, and uh, I commend you for your work. Thank you. And I just wanted to say, when, when we were starting the interview process, we had sent home a flyer <coughs> informing parents. Um, we love our PTO, our very involved parents, yeah. but we knew it was very important to get ever get the parents that aren't always coming in our mm -hmm. doors um so it's you know we would get some flyers back and they're like i'm not sure what i signed and that's when rosa came in and she's like well you signed you're coming in to be with the community school director so we had a real like a very organic pool of parents coming in um so it, it was figured, a really like, great experience you're, as you're going you're learning you know what i mean uh, it, we're, we're all we're all learning as, uh, as this goes along and uh, just think about the impact, how we can really, really combine social emotional learning with this. You know, what's going on with these families? What's happening? Let's work together. Like, wow, thank you so much. Yeah, really and that. even just spreading the knowledge of community resources that are out there. Right. Um, you know, I was taught that was part of our interviews of, do you know of community resources? Do you need any? Can we educate you on them? Yeah. And I had a parent be like, no, I'm all set. And then three weeks later, she came out to me in the schoolyard and was like, can you give me that lead? flyer and I was like yeah come on up Absolutely. so it is it is making an impact for sure Thank I think you. that relationship building I think our parents are feeling safe and welcome in our schools mm -hmm. right there's no more oh you wait at the door come on in we want yes. to hear from you we want we've got, we've got family members here right mm -hmm. the, the, but that feeling that relationship has has blossomed into trust which mm -hmm. that is evidence of I know I was interviewing a mom, like, dodging Lego blocks. Like, as her child's, I'm like, I feel like I'm at home, really. <laughs> I felt right at home. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. Kind words. Remember Castellanos, remember Gailey.
First of all, <clears throat> I'm just really grateful I didn't wear my Apple Watch tonight. My heart rate's like going. Coach, <laughs> Coach Lenny does a good job. I want to thank Member Pena for his uh, powerful testimony always. And Member Dugan, I, I, I can't echo enough. Um, I share the same uh, emotions that my colleagues just mentioned. Um, the community school framework, every time I see it, 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 it shocks me. It, it hits me to the core, uh, particularly around why we do this work. I believe when we see our students succeed, we will feel our why. I believe that. I believe the staff, the families, the, the children that we're impacting every day will feel that why. When you talked about Maslow hierarchy of needs, that's food, shelter, social, emotional learning. When you don't have those all in your life, in your ecosystem, you're educational trajectory is threatened. As a first generation low income Latino, I had that in my life. I had missing blocks though, unfortunately. I didn't go through a community school. I didn't have that village. But what I had though, well, I had a lot of great Lynn Public School uh, mentors. I had a lot of good people in my life. And I'm one of the lucky ones. And the people that, uh, the children especially that you're impacting, um, Education is a team win. I like education is a team sports. Team sport and kids uh, must win. I felt that. I feel it every single day. Every single day, your commitment is going to change a child's life. And it's going to change your life. Because quality of work, that, feel, that impact that you're looking for, it's going to be right there. And what you're doing is so important. It's so greatly appreciated. Um, I am so just just rejuvenated and just so excited to see what's happening. I want to thank United Way for always showing up for the city of Lynn. Because it's not just there. They show up. They show up. They show up. And it's amazing to see the leaders in Lynn Public Schools partner with United Way and to see the success that we're having and to continue that on. Um, always my support. Um, thank you. That's not my elevator pitch, but it's close to it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long elevator ride. <laughs> we can trim it. I get permission for United Way to use it. <laughs> Uh, no, to the 50th floor. <laughs> <laughs> Remember Gailey. Um, first of all, I worked in the middle school most of my career, middle and high school. Um, one of the things I would talk to or ask our upper administration and what I witnessed from kids that are coming from a strong community school background is when they get into the middle school, they get lost. And I, I just don't know how we're going to support these kids when they go on to the middle school, making sure that their basic levels are, continue to be taken care of. So and that the middle school into a community school too. <laughs> no, I understand that. However, it's like I, I got to see Claire Crane did a phenomenal job up there at Ford School. Donna Coppola, member Coppola is probably watching. Hi, Donna. She's probably thrilled because this is what she was pushing for for 24 years to continue this effort. So that's the challenge I'm putting to you. I'm putting to Dr. Alvarez is so that our students that are feeling empowered, the parents are feeling empowered, and it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to have that. Let's continue it on in the middle school. Fifth grade is going into the middle school, sixth grade. That's where they get lost. That's where things sort of like break down. And I just want to make sure we continue it so that it's like they're going to get into their senior year and they're going to be empowered and then they're just going to bring it right through the whole district. That's all. But that's excellent job. I'm very happy. How's the parking up in Highland? I mean, Ford. <laughs> oh, we have thank six you. spots at the fire station. Oh, and oh did, wonderful. Did it, are so people thank you. Are yeah. people using them? They are. Yes. They are. Okay, yeah. good. I just wanted to check on that. Thank but you. And you. did you get your basketball hoops? Not yet. Not yet. No. They're coming. <laughs> All right. But anyways, that that's my only concern about that. But excellent job. And Maslow's hierarchy has to be filled. Always. Thank you. So, uh, Member Satterwhite, Member Breed. 
Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm also excited about this as well. Uh, when I think about community resources, um, I think about the importance of accessibility, right? Um, one of the things that came to mind was wondering if we could collaborate with the Lynn Public uh, Library um, just to have access to educational materials and, and books and stuff. Um, I think the problem is that because we only have one library, not everyone has access to it. So maybe even like, this is just uh, throwing this out there, but once a week, um, the Lynn Public Library could share what they have to offer and then we could actually deliver those materials or something to them, to those who can't um, make it out to have access. So just something I was thinking about. Um, also, I think it's great that we look at local nonprofits um, because that would be able to help offer more and also take the burden off the district. So yep. thank you. Well, I'm going last. This is kind of hard. Everyone, everyone, a lot of passion already, but uh, seriously, thank you. All your passion came through so clearly, and we're, we're uh, Principal Fry, you said that we're lu you're lucky that we're on your team. No, no, we're the we're the lucky ones. Seriously, we we really are. And I think a lot of times we we think that we talk so much about parent engagement and thinking of these different strategies and you know using different technologies, but sometimes it comes down to just good old fashioned reaching out and hard work, and that's exactly what you're doing. And I know it's not easy, so it's much appreciated. Two quick questions, because I was not for the, here for the last year's presentation. Um, are there currently or will there be adult education opportunities that uh, Member Pena alluded to? And then the second one is, how do you go about like vetting and, and attracting community partners? I know, uh, Principal, you kind of alluded that now, which is kind of self-sustaining, but just curious how that kind of works. Dr. Anita, anyone? So, to to yes, so we, so I was a, a principal in Marblehead yep. for, for 12 years. And so I began by optimizing my social network that way. Um, and I've reached out to Rotary. I was at a Rotary, Rotary meeting today to meet some more folks. And then cold calls and chatting people up and asking the fa family members with whom I speak, who else should I talk to? What yeah. connections do you think I should, you know? Old fashioned, yeah. Old fashioned. That was one of our questions. Yeah. 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 But, you know, m much of it is just face to face. Um, and that was part of the, the that's part of it. Right. You know, you know, when we first started this project, it has to be a partnership that works together. It has to be when I was interviewing uh, Nina, like this, we're not losing, right? All kids have to win. She's like, I don't, I'll do it. <laughs> I'll call them. I don't, you know, give me a number. I'll call them. So right? What are they going to? Right? They're just going to. They could say no. And you know, it. Some people can say that, and then some people do that. And she does that, and you're starting to do that, like, or you know, and so I think that's the power we, is we, in the work. We complement you guys each partner. other very yes. well. With, mm, yeah. with but our they go out and, and knock our, on doors. The awesome. people we know. Yeah, knock on doors, make phone calls, invite people in. You know, anybody's invited, right? Our buildings are. Oh my, I'm not going to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Washington's open, right? The door's open, right? Like we are, you know, we are not, again, you, you've allowed us to be out of the shadows. The doors are open. We are who we are. They're we're, not propped open, though. No, you know? no, no. <laughs> you got to bring, you got to have pad, bad and all that. But the point being, like we, our schools are perfect, right? They are a reflection of the community. And if we can establish that, build that, complete that, right? Put that picture together, it's a beautiful thing. And so the doors are open and you know, I often say to people, like, I'm not gonna talk to you about it, you gotta come. Right. You gotta come see it, you gotta come feel it. And cause that's what it is, it's a feeling. And you feel safe, you feel the happiness. I, people all the time come through, teachers actually smile in the hallways, right? They're happy to be there. And it's not an easy school to work at. It's not an easy population, it's not easy problems. Everything is bigger and multi and you know magnified, but we're doing the thing, right? We're doing the thing. Yeah. So we appreciate and, you guys. And I've um, been a part of Lynn Public Schools for about two and a half years now. I was previously the homeless liaison for the district, um, so I just wanted to say that you know it is the community does want to help and everyone wants to be involved. So it's. It's really not hard making those asks because the outcome is going to be so important. I just want to add, oh sorry Sarah, I just want to add how important the leadership of the school leader mm -hmm. is in this strategy. For Amy and Anthony to really be embraceive of 
Nina and Amy and the work that they're doing, that makes all the difference because that could be a barrier to bringing in the partners, bringing in the families, bringing in the student voice. And, and they see the families as leaders, right? Like the families are the assets to the community. So we know that our families intrinsically have the value, like they're not just needy. <laughs> yes, we all have needs, but our families are leaders. And I think the work that you all have been doing to elevate that family voice and create the opportunity for the family voice also speaks to why it's been so successful thus far. And then just a bit of a kind of shameless plug here. I think this is also having your friends at United Way at the table of having decades and in some cases a century of partnership with a number of the nonprofits sure. in the community mm -hmm. is as Amy and Nina and Anthony and Amy are saying, we really need this or we need that. And we're like, let me tell you about Leo. Let me tell you about Girls Inc. Let's bring in the Y. Let's bring in the Boys and Girls Club, right? <coughs> How do we really tap this network of community partners that so deeply cares about families, kids, neighborhoods, uh, and really joining us on this systems change journey. It's not just about repeating the same things we've been doing for decades, because that's not working for kids. It's about really centering all of our community's needs and bringing the right players together. And yes to adult education. So our parents want language instruction. They also want computer instruction, financial literacy. So. I met with the New Americans Center and a meeting with Pathways to just find out what they're doing, what resources they have. But within our building, we have staff who are interested and willing to lead some of those learning experiences for adults also. So we got you. <laughs> Thank you Thanks. so much for the tremendous presentation, for all the incredible work, for the whole team that's doing it. I know a lot of educators and, and community members, and I also would like to thank the, 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 the families who, you, who you're working with, you know, opening their lives up to us to be a bigger part of them. So thank you all so much. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, next item is a ratification of votes, if any, taken in Buildings and Grounds Subcommittee. <coughs> Member Gately. Hold on. One second. Um, in Buildings and Grounds, we made a motion and took a vote on um, Ingalls Garden Improvement Plan for their project, food project, and they voted to move it to the full committee. Great. Is there a second? Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Next item is communications and information. Thank you. Um, so for communications, to keep uh, all informed, we I had briefly touched up upon Rosetta Stone back during our descent last um, meeting in December. And just wanted to share with you i'm not going to read through the entire press release it's going to go up online for everyone to read but just um to touch upon the fact that the the internal team has developed a process um, for uh, the actual use of this program for students for um, families as well as all staff so the different departments um, throughout the coming week will start releasing uh, through messenger and also putting up on our LPS website you know how to log into the portal what are the instructions that they need to follow um, and those instructions will also come to you as a school committee because you are as part of the staff will be able to also learn a language um, it was covered and featured in uh, as part of uh, an, an item article recently uh, and I just wanted to highlight for everyone that you know, Rosetta Stone is um, research-based, it's grounded in evidence, and it has been effective both for students that speak um, other languages as a primary language, as well as English as a first language. And so because of that, uh, we feel that this initiative is extremely important. Um, it, as far as how it touches our families, uh, we just heard that community school presentation and um, you know there are intended uses in those settings but there will be um, uses in our other school settings as well where we intend to uh, find ways to open 
um, computer labs so that parents can come in to our schools and be able to use the program if they do not have access um, to a you know a computer at home or just simply want a quiet place right to work and actually uh, engage in learning a language so we're really excited about this project and initiative and thinking about two things in particular um, the data that we've that we know uh, right now is that over the period of the next 10, 15 years, um, the majority of the United States will be not only be black and brown, but speaking Spanish. And it is, uh, yes, a disservice to our students who are monolingual and do not speak Spanish to not afford them the opportunity to learn, to have the ability to compete for jobs um, of the future, and as well as our students who only speak right other languages besides Spanish to not help them accelerate their English acquisition skills. So I just wanted to bring that um, to the forefront as we move forward with this exciting project and, and how we're going to use it. Um, and Kevin and I are going to learn Portuguese together. So <laughs> just be ready um, for the upcoming school committee meetings. Uh, the next the next communication is uh, about Lego education, and I'm really excited about sharing this one. Um, this is this is really the initial stage of how we're using Lego and STEM robotics in the after-school elementary programs. Um, it's starting with fifth grade. Uh, not to say that over a course of time and ta you know, and as we think about using. Um, Lego education and working with them as strategic partners that it won't be uh, woven into maybe even some of the core of what we do in STEM instruction at the K through five level um, and in our curriculum. So, we, you know, we'll continue to think about that and how we can get that done. So those two will go up online um, tomorrow morning since they were uh, released to you this evening. Um, the next uh, communication is on an internal audit of the circuit breaker, which is specific to special education. Um, and where this came from is in doing a review um, and in a lot of internal discussions with our team and our special education department and with Dr. Colella um, taking over uh, SPED, we think about, we have a lot of areas that we know are in need of reform, right, within our special education um, practices. And so to start and really think about where was the beginning of that, um, you know, reform that we need to do, um, Kevin and I were seeking to really establish and get a better handle on what were the, in, the financial mechanisms that we need to start reviewing to ensure that we are getting maximum reimbursements <coughs> on, um, from the circuit breaker, meaning uh, what were those reimbursements for students that require, right, um, depending on the level of services that they require and uh, were we actually getting those reimbursements? And so I want to just walk you through some summary points. This is a summary of the actual um, audit, internal audit that we did. Uh, it was done by Dr. Nadine Ekstorm, and she uh, has a, a background and is very well known here in Massachusetts. She was a superintendent, executive director, specialized director for um, special education, student services, um, she's very, you know, very well regarded and also worked with Desi for a period of time. And I put the link in there if you want to uh, look at her background uh, as well. So the findings were really about uh, a couple of things that were highlighted to us. The potential for significant reimbursements um, of missed opportunities within in-district as well as uh, out of district special education programming. So, you know, the internal audit revealed that we are not seeking all of the reimbursements possible. And that is something that we need to correct immediately. Um, then there was a discovery of gaps uh, in the reporting system. 
um, of who, what, and when services were reportable. Um, so that means, for example, a nurse, a para, right, who provides direct services, or in what setting, um, whether it was you know one to one or whether it was in a classroom setting. Um, and so services provided by professionals were not consistently documented. The other uh, opportunity for growth for us is really looking at um, the student IEP service delivery grid, uh, who attended in district um, special education programming. The information appears to be missing on which services should be included in an IEP uh, to support circuit breaker reimbursement. So that's um, you know, a significant shift in some of the practices that we need to look forward now into training um, those that are involved in developing IEP goals. Mm. Uh, overall, we discovered that um, LPS really has yet to request reimbursements for all in-district students who require significant special education support, including med medical services, during the school day and extensively substantially separate related services to assess their education, to access their education. Um, the last point was really that it was recognized that the district recently invested in a new student reporting system which aligns differently from the IEP platform and that's potentially causing gaps in providing required information to report cir circuit breaker reimbursements accurately. Um, so some of the recommendations follow uh, here on page two and they're listed. Um, we're working uh, cohesively between the special education team, the business office, data assessment and accountability to really look at the data that we do need, look at our power school, um, look at the alignment and the communication systems that we currently have in place um, as we transition also into the <coughs> easy IEP system, um, which will facilitate some of this process, but we're not fully, we're not in full implementation of that at this point in time. Um, the second thing is really protocol development. Um, that's all, again, about systems and structures, right? Um, and that re really requires clear and explicit understanding of the, um, not just the data and information needed just for circuit breaker reporting, but also, again, development of IEP goals, what is an, uh, what is an individualized education plan, right? Um, we have them for a reason, and documentation of all of the services need to be on there in order for us to seek these reimbursements. So that's just part of it. But this also impacts, we understand, the education that students are receiving in, um, as special education students on a daily basis. So we take this with utmost seriousness um, and have started, Dr. Colella has started to uh, look at this in, in really looking at what are those students with the highest matrix levels and then working our way backwards. Um, and it's going to take us a considerable amount of time because we'll have to review IEPs, um, you know, conduct interim meetings and all those annual meetings, right? We'll require um, the training of the, those that are writing the goals in order to make sure that we correct um, this problem in particular. Uh, the third point here was really just claims um, and making sure that we have clear protocols for out of district um, and in district reporting. And so, um, you know, this is, this is just really following DESE's um, best practices and guidelines, um, which we have not always complied with. So, uh, and then on the last page, it's really about, again, the IEP writing. Um, the audit findings suggest that information currently needs to be added to student IEPs, and there's a misalignment between the description of district programs and student IEPs. And so what that tells us is, and there's some points here on you know, where we're going to begin to really follow a corrective action plan, but um, one of our next goals is also to identify in the sequencing of programming for all students in special education what is missing? We know clearly that we um, have gaps in some of our models um, in terms of grade levels, in terms of support, in terms of even transitional 
services. And so um, that'll be some of our next steps uh, in how we manage this corrective action. So this is in addition to, right? But this is what has also contributed to the, um, the tier focus monitoring report that we keep hearing about, right, of all our violations as a district that have sort of accumulated uh, over the last 10 years. Mm. So I don't know if their deputies want to add anything to no. this no, summary. Okay. Member Castellanos. Thank you, Dr. Alvarez, for the deep explanation on what we're dealing with here. How far, when I look at the reimbursements, like how many years are we talking, um, are we eligible to get reimbursed? So, if we can. So, this was one of the questions um, that Kevin and I had. We cannot modify um, sc prior school years, unfortunately, right? Um, it's not even a question of like taking this back to Desi. There's things that have not been submitted. And um, w what we can do is create the action plan to now start looking at everything mid-year and ma ensuring that the July submission is accurate. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, probably at that point, I would say, Kevin, you can disagree with me, we'll probably be able to tell between the difference in what we um, submit uh, in July, looking back at some of the years and based on like the number of students in our population, we could probably predict how long and how much uh, we have not been reimbursed for. But I couldn't tell you at this time. Okay. okay. So during campaigning over the last, I don't know, five or six years I've had this one constituent come up to me and he you know I work at Desi and you're not getting all your circuit breaker money and I never ever understood what he was talking about I couldn't figure it out because I assumed that everything was in place so now I just want to say how grateful I am that this happened and that we will get our full impact of our circuit break money in the future. Thank you. Thank you all for that. Kevin, is there anything you'd like to add? No, I think I think you summarized it. But as far as you know, we can't go back. But I think you know we met with the consultant, and she's going to be working with us to look at the existing. There are probably going to be some more reimbursements we didn't normally apply for this year within the existing IEPs that we have in place, but. Okay. The reality is, I think the superintendent said, until we get the, all those IEPs fixed or explaining all the different services, because that's how you gain the funds by all those additional services be spelled out within the IEP. That's going to take some time. So next year, as we move into next year, that should hopefully be resolved, and we'll be getting all the full claims we can. And the important thing is, you know, this is something can only be used. We use it to offset our tuition, which means it gives us more funds in our budget process to use elsewhere because this reduces our tuition cost. And when we get through the budget, you'll see the number there. So hopefully that this should be expected to go up next year to even more money than we normally get. So we'll be projecting that out too. Wow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? Yeah, just yeah, a quick Thank you, right. Dr. Alvarez. Just a quick question. I was curious, was, um, Compliance officer Charlie Gallo like involved in the audit as well? No. No, this was purely a financial audit at this point in time. Um, as I said, as we look at the models, right, in terms of programming, what does that mean? So if we look at, you know, the, con the continuation of how we offer um, coach, task, um, through from K to 12, just two examples, making sure that there are support services K to 12, that we have the proper supports in place for when students transition out of a program, right? Um, things of that nature that we know we are lacking at this time. So that, that, that will be a completely different process. This was purely financial. And so we, you know, there was a, the consultant went through like documents and financials that we provided to her from 
um, our SPED office. I, I would just add that um, Dr. Kalala is, is spending a great deal of time with the special education team, reviewing all procedures, process, systems, and we're actually, the Department of Ed is putting in a new IEP system statewide that will go into effect in uh, September, and Dr. Kalala is already in the process of getting trainings going and getting this so this is a perfect time to get the calibration of everyone's practices the same um, and she, they're working very hard to do that and member Satterwhite just to and I'm not sure you know in terms of compliance and also knowing that Charlie you know has the the um, lens from the lawyer perspective right um, our attorney Katie Meinalt has been spending a significant amount of time with uh, the SPED team and with Dr. Colella uh, more than she normally would because the support is needed at this time. And she's been supporting and reviewing, right, um, a number of things, including some of this process, um, because she is the, the attorney that we have that supports <coughs> special education services. So I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we are days away, maybe not even days, might even be hours away from Easy IEP and Power School actually talking to each other and information being, you know, yeah. updated regularly. So today we were in a meeting and I believe Dr. Colella said they have had a meeting this afternoon. I haven't talked to her to find out are we there, but we're right close. there, very close. This question is just around just demographic, around the comps around the Commonwealth, right? How many, like for, for our special ed operation capacity-wise, how do we compare, like how many kids, I feel like Lynn Public Schools handles a lot of kids with IEPs. I feel like special ed is, is it's packed compared to other districts. And I don't know what the, the updated this year's numbers are, but could we pull that up to see the comps? And yeah. you see how, there are, how other districts are also maybe affected by this? We, we definitely could. Um, you know, our, I know at the last reporting, right, we're still overrepresented in students that are in special education as compared to other districts, heavily overrepresented. Um, and so, you know, the numbers, I remember that uh, Dr. Detuya presented at the last, at the final meeting that he was present at, um, haven't changed at this point. And so we're, we're really looking at, like we've improved um, the number of IEPs that are in compliance, but that hasn't decreased the number of students, right, that are in special education that are overrepresented as compared to students in other districts or even similar districts um, that have, our, you know, a similar minority population. I asked that question because uh, to remember Gately's point about someone from Desi kind of asking, like, kind of like hinting towards, oh, mm -hmm. your, your circuit breaker money. It's it's a little disturbing right. to hear that, and I and I believe it. And to mm -hmm. hear, I, I don't believe we're just the only ones. You know, I feel like it, it's a bigger issue, maybe. But no, I, I don't know that. Um, the certainly in in talking to Kevin, you know, about some of our numbers and our financials overall. Um, some of the things that for me, just the number of students, the number, the amount of reimbursement and um, the cost of our out of district, um, which is, you know, of, of student support, which is close to 15 million right now, um, were certainly some numbers that I thought that we needed to actually review and make certain that we are spending um, the way we're supposed to be spending. And so, you know, We'll, we'll continue to go through these numbers until we get it right. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Sure. And last um, on our agenda is the superintendent's report. Uh, as we close the month of January, safety in our schools remains a top priority. We continue implementing and enhancing security measures to ensure a safe and supportive learning environment. Um, our project with Verkata is underway with wiring and a number of 
um, components of the phases that um, we will share at a later time. Um, we're currently in that first phase of the ongoing investment of that advanced security technology. And um, these are all obviously critical components of our comprehensive approach to safeguarding the well-being of students, staff, and faculty. This past week, we had an incredible, incredibly successful meeting with our high school students. Um, the Centering Youth Voices has 10 students from our, um, all of our high schools that are now uh, sitting as my advisory board, student advisory board. They, uh, we, they are just incredible. Um, so in the spirit of shared governance and amplifying the voices of students and teachers, we had a robust converse, uh, discussion on physical safety uh, and belonging in our high school campuses. Student voice is obviously crucial in shaping our educational practices, and we're actively working to create platforms for students to express their perspectives and contribute in decision-making processes. processes. Um, my student advisory group compri comprises of 10 students in grades 9 through 12, they are articulate, insightful, honest, and a very observant group. They're very, um, they're actually brilliant. They will support us, the adults, in developing better systems and structures for our district. The intent is really to enhance and improve the student experience because although we work for students, we rarely ask them what they think about process, policies, and our procedures. Um, our staff of Color Affinity Group has partnered in mentoring um, with that student advisory board and uh, two of our faculty members were present during that meeting also taking notes and um, really sitting in as role models as we had uh, uh, that robust discussion. Uh, similarly, the input of dedicated teaching staff and school leaders is invaluable, and through our collaborative efforts, we're empowering committees, fostering an environment where educators play a central role in curriculum development, school initiatives, we spoke about the program of studies today, providing feedback on how also policy affects students and the daily operation of schools. We're reviewing several policies um, that significantly impact the student experience. I shared this with the student advisory um, group as well, and they were all in agreement that these were things that we needed to look at immediately. Um, the grading policy, a comprehensive one, um, dress code, maximum age of school admission, and attendance. We continue to focus on improving classroom instruction through rigor. Our, our curriculum department focuses on district prioritization and disparities in data between students who are performing and those students su subgroups who are underperforming as compared to their peers. Um, our leaders are implementing the MTSS, the multi-tiered systems of support in our schools, and we continue to work out and enhance that through a number of um, areas. So attendance, um, academics, behavioral and social emotional um, spaces. The first tier really encompasses that high quality evidence-based instruction for all students, while second tier offers targeted interventions for those needing additional assistance. And the third tier really involves the intensive individualized interventions for students required, um, requiring more s specialized support. That MTSS enhances academic achievement and fosters positive school culture by promote, promoting early intervention, collaboration among educators, and data-driven decision-making processes that ensure that students receive support necessary to succeed. Our innovation team has started an exciting project, um, the design of a STEAM 6 through 12 model at this time. This exciting work is certainly needed to begin our district shift to innovative in implementation of the STEAM model in schools, transforming education by fostering creativity, critical thinking, and interdisciplinary learning. The STEAM 6 through 12 model will include specific courses and enrichment activities that allow students to use the science inquiry model. I'm waiting for member Gately to say something. Um, STEAM education inspires students to explore real world problems and develop solutions collaboratively by integrating cutting edge technologies project and project based learning approaches. Maker spaces equipped with advanced tools and materials um, that provide students with hands on experiences, allowing them to design, experiment, and prototype. 
Moreover, connecting arts with STEM disciplines enhances creativity and encourages students to approach problem solving holistically. So we're embracing an innovative STEAM model um, as we prepare students for the demands of technology driven, a technology driven future that cultivates a culture of curiosity, adaptability, and innovation that extends beyond the classroom. Through this STEAM education, schools empower students to become forward thinking contributors to a rapidly evolving global landscape. And all of that will be, right, where we, um, we'll see changes as we go through that program of studies. Uh, also, the innovation team has been working with the high school principals to um, des use design thinking in developing themed pathways that are relevant and engaging for students. One example includes the modernization of course offerings in the IT pathway at both classical and English, um, including courses and standards that teach data science, financial technologies, artificial intelligence, and more, uh, a more robust cadre of co coding courses that will provide students with competi the competitive edge needed in today's business workforce. Um, a vision over time for this pathway is that students will be able to combine skills from several disciplines. An example of a project that encompasses many skills for an excellent product is the website creation. Great websites entail coding, for example, fine arts photography, detail edi digital editing, and content creation. And developing all these skills in these areas can include highly engaging courses like gamification, where students shift from becoming the video game lovers to the video game producers, right? So whether they're front end or back end users makes, will we'll give them those tools. LPS can look forward to a district wide competitions to display student work. We're thinking about esports and how we can actually um, have that through our six through 12 um, programs. Uh, at Lintech, we're working on the expansion of student seats, not only in existing pathways, but also looking to expand programming to include the exciting area of biotechnology. And we're really focusing on that for school year 25, so opening that in the fall. Um, we're visiting spaces and investigating specifications for high-tech equipment that students need, and the IT and biotechnology pathways are just two innovative designs and curricula that will integrate into our high schools over the next two years. We look forward to a more complete update in March, as we shared earlier um, during Molly's presentation. Uh, I want to close this meeting by thanking all of our students, teachers, leaders, support staff, and parents who believe in the great work that we're doing together. We'll continue to show up daily with the incredible willingness and disposition to engage in culture change and student-centered spaces that will prepare all students for a promising tomorrow. Thank you. 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 Thank